good to see you. How are you? So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this press conference with <coughs> the DG, uh, Grossi. And the DG will give a few opening uh, remarks, after which we'll be more than happy to take your questions. Thank you. Well, very good. Thank you, uh, Frederick. It's good to be with you again after, uh, I think, the last time we saw each other was in August. Um, well, as you know, I'm here uh, working on the establishment of a um, uh, nuclear safety and security protection zone around the nuclear power plant in Saporizia. And uh, we have been working very, very hard. Um, I've already met uh, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, Foreign Minister Kuleva. I had a meeting with President Macron and the foreign uh, ministers of the G7. Yeah, I had a, um, um, I had a meeting with uh, uh, the two foreign ministers, Foreign Minister Lavrov, Foreign Minister um, Kuleva, and then a meeting organized or presided by um, President uh, Macron uh, and the um, Ukrainian Prime Minister with the foreign ministers of the G7 countries, the EU, um, uh, um, High Representative uh, Borrell, and uh, Mexico as well was present. So, uh, you know, uh, things are, the wheels are in motion, and I'm, uh, you know, at your disposal for any questions that you may have, wishing I can Thank answer you to all of them. We'll start over there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director General. Uh, on behalf of the United Nations Correspondent Association for this uh, briefing, uh, uh, Valeria Robecco from ANSA Newswire. So my question is, uh, Russia called uh, uh, its own technicians to manage the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, Rosatom, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so my question is, can uh, Rosatom technicians be trusted in managing uh, the plant? Uh, are they reliable uh, for a safe management of the plant? Thank you so much. Let me clarify something. The, the plant continues to be managed and operated by the Energo Atom Ukrainian um, uh, technicians and employees. What you have is the presence of a number of, uh, um, limited number, between 10 and 12, of Rosatom experts uh, as well. But they are not managing uh, the plant. The plant is being managed by the Ukrainian uh, workforce there. CBS. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you, D Director General. Hello. Nice to see you again. It's Pamela Falk from CBS Likewise, News. Pamela. Good to see you. On these, this zone, obviously the question of the day is, did you, did you get a result? Have they agreed to it? But you're clearly not there yet. But you've spoken with all sides. How far are you from getting an agreement on a zone? And are you including the South? Um, you also went to the South Ukraine. Indeed. That also, since the time you went, was shelled. So is, uh, is the, would the zone apply to all of them? And, how, and then the bigger picture question on this is, how worried are you about an accident happening? I mean, something yeah. melting down in any of those. And how, uh, indeed, how far indeed. would it go? Thank so you. now we started with the, uh, with the real negotiation of the parameters uh, of the zone. This is a process which is carried out only with Ukraine and also, of course, with Russia. Um, uh, so this is, this is one thing. Uh, getting an agreement today would have been nice, but you can imagine that these are very complex issues that require uh, perhaps um, uh, a bit more than one meeting. So, uh, but we are already working on the very concrete um, aspects that would be required to have the, the zone uh, being established. What is clear, and this is why I mentioned the number of uh, people uh, and ministers and even presidents, prime ministers that I saw in these few hours here, that uh, there is, I would say, um, above differences that do exist, there is a conviction that the establishment of this zone is indispensable. The, uh, let's be clear, this nuclear power plant is being shelled at. So you need to protect it in some way. And we have the means, the technical knowledge, as the IEA, to know what, what needs to be done and, and how to do it. So this process has uh, started. I have, of course, uh, indicated 
that this is not a negotiation of a treaty or something that could um, you know, be afforded the luxury of weeks and months and, and meetings, some preparatory meetings, and we have to decide on it as soon as possible. And I hope I will be able to do that. Um, in terms of, your, of, uh, of the preoccupation, it's, it's, it's huge. Um, since the shelling and the bombardment doesn't stop, since almost every day we have a new episode. After um, I visited uh, Zaporizhia for a few days, uh, the situation, without being absolutely quiet, became a bit better, but then problems s reappeared. And uh, what we saw in the last few hours was, again, shelling and, and, uh, and direct attacks on the facility. So I'm, I'm very worried. One of the things that happened was that a, 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 a pool where, where um, spent nuclear fuel is being cooled became, uh, you know, um, uh, stopped operations because one pipeline was, was affected, etc. So any time something can happen. I've been saying this uh, for many, many months. We are playing with fire. We continue to play with fire. I'm trying to do as much as I can, as fast as I can. Wait, can I just clarify uh, 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 just the sentence that you said that all sides agree that, uh, that it's indispensable? Is that Russia and Ukraine? I think they know it's indispensable. I, I would not speak for them. I, would, I should never do that. But the, the mere fact that the two foreign ministers are sitting down with me and are listening to our ideas, uh, I think it's a good indicator that there is uh, a very strong, solid base for this thing to happen. Yes, yes Joseph Klein, Canada Free Press. Uh, Where are you, sir? Ah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, Joseph Klein, Canada Free Press. I just Hello. want to turn to Iran for a moment. Could you tell us where things stand in the IAEA's efforts to get Iran to agree uh, to uh, allow you to continue your investigation of past traces of uranium and also to uh, allow you back into the various sites so that you can monitor uh, well, activities. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, our inspections continue. What has, has happened is that we have been limited. Some of our capacities have, have been curtailed. Uh, or interrupted. Um, uh, where we stand is that uh, we um, have been um, reporting, including to the um, Board of Governors of the IEA, on what I have characterized as a lack of progress in the engagement. And I have been manifesting to our Iranian counterparts that we are ready to re-engage. These things are not going to uh, be wished away. Are, are, are there, and we need to clarify them. I, I hope in the next few days to be able to reestablish um, some contacts uh, so that we can continue with this process, which has been, um, uh, you know, lingering for, for a long time. Yes, over there. Thank you so much for doing this today. Um, as you know, uh, most Iranian diplomats and delegations are here, um, including Bagheri Kani, who is leading the talks in uh, Vienna. Have you met with him? Did you have any breakthrough? What do you have to uh, do? You have to share with us in terms of like um, for, uh, from meeting um, Iranian diplomats and in terms of JCPOA and the questions of um, IAEA. I, I haven't. I haven't met with them here in New York. They know that I'm available, that I'm here, uh, but we haven't met. I hope to be able to see them, you know, in a few, in a few days, uh, we open the general conference of the IAEA. Uh, it's like the general assembly here, but for the IAEA in Vienna, and I hope there will be an opportunity uh, there. I will let you know more when I know. Thank you. Yes. James Mays from Al Jazeera, um, flipping back to Zaporizhia if I can. Yes, of course. Um, when you last addressed the Security Council on the 6th of September, afterwards, Ambassador Nebenzia was pretty skeptical about your plan. So can you tell us what response you got from Foreign Minister Lavrov to your proposal, which, as I say, the Russian side seemed pretty skeptical at the beginning of the month? And if I, secondly, um, President Erdogan, when he spoke to the UN General Assembly, said the next priority of diplomacy was Zaporizhia. As you know, President Erdogan was 
instrumental with the UN on that grain deal. Mm -hmm. He's now instrumental, we think, in the ongoing prisoner swap, which is happening as we speak. Our, is, is that Turkish route that's, that's um, yielded success in diplomacy so far, is that part of your, of, uh, are the Turks part of your initiative with regard to Zaporizhia? Well, first, on the first part, on the skepticism or otherwise, I would say, uh, these are impressions, and impressions are on the eye of the beholder. Uh, I am negotiating with Russia at the moment on the establishment of the zone, and with Ukraine, of course. So um, at this point, I think characterizations uh, are, of course, possible and, 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 and perfect uh, with me, but I'm concentrating in getting, getting to yes on both uh, sides. On, on, your, uh, on, the, on the second part of your question, no, we have not been discussing. Um, I, I recognize the constructive role Turkey has been playing. I, you may remember that at the beginning of the year in Antalya, I was able to meet also uh, with, uh, pre with um, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov and with Foreign Minister Kuleva. So I know that they have been playing this role, but not at this time. Thank you so much. Uh, Majid Gili, Rudaw Media Network. Going back to the issue of Iran, uh, Mr. Director General, uh, in terms of timeline, let's say if Iran opens its door for the three sides and let your investigators in, how long it will take for, for IAEA to make sure that uh, what happened to those traces of to those uranium? Is there a timeline? And also, is there a method to make sure that what they say, that Iran's nuclear uh, program is... 100% peaceful in its nature. Thank well, you. in terms of a timeline, it's the timeline. Sorry, it's difficult to say because uh, the clarification exercise is an um, interactive, um, iterative exercise where we put questions, receive answers, and and fr depending on the nature of these answers, there may be more questions or not. Uh, so to tell you now, we hope that in three weeks we'll be able. It will be a bit artificial. I hope you would agree with me. So it would depend on, on the, the, the level of engagement. We do not, I, I, at the same time, I don't want to you know, leave you without an idea. And what we believe is that with um, a full engagement, uh, with, uh, with openness, uh, this should not take uh, years. It should take perhaps a few months. But I am pretty confident that we would be able to get to, to some clarification of what, uh, what happened there. Did I miss anything on your question? Okay. No. Question over there, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, thank hello. you so much. Uh, I'm Veronica from Ukraine. Hello. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, the report that uh, was issued uh, not yes. so long ago uh, about the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that Russia, uh, in the re report said that Russia must uh, withdraw all the military equipment from the plant and also give some more uh, days off and hours off to the exhausted personnel which uh, is working there. I wonder uh, whether Russia has fulfilled any of your recommendations featured in the report already and what are the latest news uh, from uh, EIA uh, workers that are still there on the plant? Thank well, you. regarding military equipment, uh, this is what it is in the report. It's, it's, for, it's a public report, 52 pages of information and evaluation and assessment on our part. So I think uh, what we said is, is clear and has been stated there. Uh, I would say that the uh, issue of military equipment, military presence and so on is part of the protection zone. So I hope to be able to make progress on that. Uh, side as well. Regarding the staffing issues, they are very important. Um, we are following up very closely. As you know, I have my experts there at the moment as part of ISAMS, the, the uh, IEA support and assistant mission in Zaporizhia. Uh, so they, they are there, they are in constant contact um, with them and uh, trying to ensure that their work conditions are normal and everything is uh, in the best uh, possible way. At the same time, we have to recognize that insofar as this situation continues, of course, we are in a, in a situation which is not normal. So um, uh, it has to be um, returned to normalcy as soon as possible. It's uh, Alain Dargan from MTV Lebanon. So technically speaking, so Iran's enriched 60% and close to 90%. This was from your reports. What does guarantee that Iran does not already produce a nuclear bomb or a grade of kind of bomb that is not a traditional uh, well, bomb? Yes, yes. It's, it, it, 
what I would say is that we have to make a differentiation here between having enriched uranium and having a bomb. Having enriched uranium is an indispensable step, if you want, but enriched uranium at that and even higher levels exist in many countries. The issue here is having the necessary collaboration from the Iranian side so that the IEA can inspect at the level which is required. Regarding uh, a nuclear weapon program, at this point we do not have any information that Iran would be having such a program. As you know, that, that requires different activities uh, from simply enriching uranium that would take uh, other issues in, into consideration. So at the moment we are, we are dealing with a nuclear material that exists and trying to make sure that all that material is accounted for. Question over there. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. My name is Nata Lutsenko, ICTV station in Ukraine. I'm a part of Doug Hammarskjöld program here. And as a Ukrainian journalist, I could not ask you back to the, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. I could not ask you about the employees. Um, I mean, we've heard the information that Russian occupier is torturing them. Do you have any information? You've been there. Do the, are they exhausted? I mean, what are it? Uh, what do these people telling you? And about the mission are still presenting at the Porizhia nuclear power plant. Do occupiers, Russian occupiers, giving them access to every locations yes. they needed for examination? Thank well, you. on the on the staff, which I think is a very very important uh, issue, uh, I think the report the report I, I produced was was clear in in, in this sense. Um, uh, the situation is not a sustainable situation. It's a situation of great stress. It is a situation where uh, hierarchy lines could be confused and thus create problems in terms of the functioning of a plant. Uh, in terms of torture and things like that, we haven't seen that. I have to be the IEA is objective. We have to inform things as they are. Much as I say this, we are saying the situation is not a sustainable situation. It's a situation of enormous stress and is something that should be uh, corrected. And the second part of your question was? About the mission and uh, access to all the locations. We do have access to, to, uh, to every, every part. One thing is important. The IEA is, uh, is an, an agency, a, a technical organization that has been conducting inspections for more than half a century. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to hide things from, from experienced inspectors. Experienced inspectors know what to look for, what to ask, where to see. And if they are denied, if they were denied access to a place where they should be, I would report it immediately, just in the case of other countries that have been mentioned uh, today. When we have a problem, we immediately um, ring the alarm bell and say we are not getting to where we would need to, to be. So uh, we are very confident that the mission uh, is working well. Uh, we are going to enlarge the mission. We are going to make it bigger uh, in, the next, uh, in the next few days. So I believe that uh, we are working well within, of course, the difficult circumstances that are there. Hi, Mr. Grossi. This is uh, Digital Shui with China Central Television. Hello. Uh, you, you just talked that you, you have talked with uh, both Russian and Ukrainian ministers, and, and I, get, I presume you talked to them separately. Yes. Um, so I just want to know when you talk to them, what, what's the biggest differences uh, when, when you're talking about establish a security zone? What's the biggest difference from both sides that probably you might need to have more work on that? Well, I would say. Um, the, the negotiation is starting now, uh, and what we are, I'm focusing, is on, the, on what is needed, uh, to use a technical word, the parameters. What is, what is it that needs to be agreed to, for a protection zone to be established? And I must say that uh, each side is going to be focusing on the feasibility of these commitments for them. So uh, in, uh, perhaps I cannot go much further than that at this point, but simply to tell you that it's a very technical conversation when we are looking at what is needed and whether this is uh, agreeable for, for both. Yes. Yes. Um, 
Thank you very much, Mr. Grossi. Nice to see you. Nice to see you again. Letter of, yes. From the Associated Press. A couple of follow-ups. Um, first, um, how are the negotiations that you did today with the two foreign ministers going to be followed up here, elsewhere, where? <coughs> Maybe you'll answer that, and then I'll ask my next follow-up. I presume, um, I have discussed just now with Minister Kuleva, I, I hope to be heading to, to Kiev or to Ukraine soon, uh, and perhaps later on to Russia at some point. But as, as, as I said in the beginning, this, given the urgency of the situation and the gravity of what's going on on the field, we have to move fast. So I'm trying to make it happen as soon as I can. And um, I know you met with the G7 foreign yeah. ministers. Can you um, tell, give us what, what was that meeting about? What came out of it? Uh, what, what did you well, want from well, it? Uh, you know, uh, for, for this negotiation to succeed, of course, it takes us, the IAEA, and Ukraine mainly, and then, of course, Russia, to agree on something. Uh, but it's also very important for uh, other countries to express their views, in particular countries that have been uh, supporting, uh, in this case, Ukraine, but it could be Russia if there was the case. The G7 is not in that, in that configuration. But uh, it, I think it's important that um, uh, there is, and I am very, very grateful for President Macron's initiative to, to have this, um, since this is helping me uh, create the necessary awareness and support that is needed for this negotiation to, to succeed. Um, and one final um, follow-up. Um, is the discussion that you're having with both Russia and Ukraine involving how a zone would be implemented and how an agreement would be enforced? Yes. Uh, hello, Mr. Director General. Um, my name is Kursi Abari, a DAC Hammer School Fellow and Asia Times correspondent from Iran. Um, hello. My question is on um, the JCPOA. Are the technical differences between the IAEA and Iran interactable and uh, are going to result in the um, suspended animation um, or the possible collapse of the JCPOA, or uh, are you uh, of the opinion that uh, finally Iran is prepared to respond to your questions and make clarifications that will be conducive nothing to is, uh, the nothing is in, nothing is intractable. Nothing is intractable. These questions are pretty straightforward, and I think you know, and, and the world knows because my reports are widely known. What is it that we found, and the questions we are putting? So uh, I don't think we are. Uh, overstretching the the uh, goodwill of the Islamic Republic by asking them these 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 questions, so I think they they are they we we could start solving them uh, pretty soon. Well, I I hope it, it is there. I think uh, um, as I was saying, I I hope to be able to reestablish the dialogue uh, at the appropriate levels, political and also technical as soon as possible. We, we are here, and it's in our interest to solve this as soon as possible. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Nick Schifrin from PBS NewsHour, good to see you. Um, Hello. Can you tell us a little bit more about the pipeline that was affected, uh, as, as you put it earlier, why uh, a pool where spent nuclear fuel is being cooled st suddenly stopped operations yeah. today? And, and give us a little context, because I think, as, as you know, I was just in Ukraine, I was in Nikopol, I was in, in the edge uh, of Zaporizhia, and at that time, there was a lot of concern uh, about the sixth reactor going under cold shutdown. Of course, it has been because Ukraine was able to restore electricity Indeed. into the plant. Was there some kind of agreement where Russia stopped hitting, let me rephrase that, was there some kind of agreement where there, there were uh, explosions that targeted the incoming electricity stopped? And it seems like the period in which there was a little bit of quiet, that the concern reduced a little bit, that allowed Ukraine to reestablish that incoming electricity, that seems to have ended. And, and so can you explain why? And that's the context for what well, happened today. Thanks. There was no agreement. This is why I'm, I'm trying to, to succeed as soon as possible 
uh, on the establishment of a protection zone. And if anything, um, uh, and I would say regrettably, um, the situation has again uh, degraded uh, itself. Uh, so an agreement is needed uh, on the establishment of a protection zone. Uh, on the um, issue of the spent fuel, as you know, being six reactors there, there's, a, there's quite a good amount of uh, fresh fuel and also spent fuel. Spent fuel, after it, it has been burned or used within the reactors, uh, has to be stored uh, and, and continue to be cooled. Um, the, uh, these open uh, ponds are part of, of that process. And in one of these parts, there was a pipe that was uh, you know, hit and it and it stopped and it stopped working. But we, c I don't know by what, some projectile, um, and uh, but it was possible for the um, uh, technical experts uh, there to uh, to have a, a shortcut and to use uh, other uh, ava still available capacities to continue uh, pumping water into the place. But this is only an example of how is it possible that we have the biggest nuclear power plant in Europe that is working on these conditions, shelled, nuclear, I mean, uh, external power, restored, interrupted, restored, interrupted, fuel, um, uh, spent fuel ponds, uh, not workable. No one would ever run a, a plant like this in normal, in normal circumstances with all these problems. And, the, and that, oh, sorry, the external electricity, that still remains in, it, right? It, it remains, but it's, it's, it's very uncertain and unpredictable. Yes. Thank you very much. Evelyn Leopold. Um, Mr. Director, if there is no J JCPOA deal, are you at all apprehensive that other Middle East nations would move towards building a nuclear weapon? Well, I believe that going, going down that path would be uh, very detrimental to international peace and security, so we really hope that doesn't happen. Um, uh, uh, you know, with or without JCPOA, I think this is an absolute uh, factor that should always be uh, respected. We recognize that the absence of an agreement would certainly not add to certainty and to confidence and trust in the region. But that is a speculative question, and I don't like to get too much into speculation. Question over there. Yeah, Benny Avni of the New York Sun. Um, President Raisi said today that Iran complied with its uh, JCPOA um, provisions, uh, considering the unresolved situation, the unresolved question about um, uh, enriched uranium found in undeclared site. Would you say that is true? And also, would you say that Iran is also complying with its NPT obligations? Well, regarding the JCPOA, as everybody knows, Iran was compliant with the provisions of the JCPOA until it decided to gradually reduce its, its observance um, of the different obligations and commitments there. And this was done openly. Uh, so at the moment, they are not compliant with that. But that is an, an agreement with, uh, with a, a number of states. Regarding the NPT and normal, let's put it like that, regular safeguards uh, obligations, quite clearly uh, not, or at least, at least not in the, uh, in the degree and, and to the level that they should, because there are these issues uh, on which they, we have been struggling uh, with, uh, with Iran, and we haven't been able to, to clarify them. So to, uh, that doesn't mean that they are not complying with anything. There are many things that are being observed, uh, but there are these three big uh, question marks, open question marks, that we still have, and they have to be uh, answered. So I hope uh, we will count on their cooperation soon. Just to follow up on the JCPOA compliance, um, since these un unresolved traces of enriched uranium, are, are they undated? Do, do they date back to the era when it was compliant with the JCPOA? In some cases, yes, but there is 
there is also additional information that dates to recent, more recent um, uh, dates, and, and this is why it's important to... And let me say something. Uh, uranium normally does not have expiry dates like yogurt, so even if it was found in 2003 or 2001 and it was not accounted for, then the question uh, is always uh, the same. If there was uranium, where is it? And uh, let, let, let us have access to it, or, or do you have any other explanation? Why is it no longer around? And then we, we, we can work uh, together, hopefully. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Grossi. Just a yeah. quick clarification about something you said earlier. You said they know you are here, but you haven't met. Is there a reason that they refuse to meet you, or why hasn't there been more effort to get a meeting with uh, either the Iranian president or, because this seems to be also one of your high priorities. How, why didn't it happen during Amda? Well, perhaps you should ask them. Okay, <laughs> and, a different, and a second question, please. Uh, how much do you think the Zaporizhia um, uh, crisis right now has taken away a little bit from uh, the focus on other crises? I know you guys are great at multitasking, but uh, there's so much focus there, and I wonder if um, there's any well, uh, no, you know, uh, people uh, have asked uh, th that question. I think we, we have a mission, uh, uh, insofar as the IEA is concerned. So if there are three crises, we have to be up to the task. And if there is none, uh, well, so much better. But uh, uh, maybe it's a, it's a matter of a public perception that there has been more uh, focus on this, and also because of the immediacy of the danger. When you're talking about... Um, not necessarily talking about Iran in this case. I'm talking um, in the absolute, if you allow me. Uh, when you talk about the possibility of uh, uh, the uh, obligations under the NPT not being fully observed, etc., so then you are talking about something which may be of concern, but uh, it's a more of a process-oriented thing. Here we are talking about a nuclear power plant which is being bombarded, which uh, is losing external power, where uh, a nuclear uh, accident could take place. So perhaps the, the gravity, the urgent the sense of urgency, the anxiety is much higher in this regard. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no further questions, then thank you so much for coming. I thank you very much for your, your attention and your help. Thank you very much. Have a very good day. Bye-bye.